John chapter 7 this morning. I'll give you some time to turn there. We're going to finish John chapter 7 this morning as we have gone verse by verse through this wonderful gospel. And while doing that, I wanted to, to do a couple things. First off, I wanted to encourage you to come back tonight. Uh, tonight, uh, we are going through the book of Psalms, as you know, and tonight we're coming to our first imprecatory psalm, um, which if you don't know what that is, it's a psalm, essentially David praying wrath on his enemies. And so that'll be fun, uh, right? Uh, it'll be a super joyous occasion. Uh, let me just tell you this, while writing this sermon uh, the Lord struck my computer with lightning. Uh, if that doesn't tell you anything about the fact that you need to be here tonight, um, I'm not saying he's going to strike you if you don't. I can't speak for him, but maybe. Who knows? No, I'm kidding. Um, so uh, I, want, I would love for you to come here tonight. It'll be very interesting. And you know what? If we're going to be faithful to preach God's word, we need to be faithful to preach the entire counsel of God's word. And so that's exactly what we'll do tonight. And I did, I can't, you know, I, can't, I just can't help it. I did want to mention a couple of our guests here this morning. Uh, first off, uh, Brother Ben and Miss Krista McMillan. Uh, now we can say that. They share a last name. Uh, and so uh, they are here from Louisville, Kentucky. Ben is one of the, the many who was raised here in church, who's now serving Christ in seminary. And Krista as well is in seminary, about to, to finish up. So we praise God for them. Welcome to you guys as well. And then Frank and Chris Ting are here this morning. Hey, guys, how are you? Yeah. Frank was in my wedding. That's all you need to know about him. Um, yeah, former deacon here. They've served this church so well. Two of my best friends in the world, and I'm so happy uh, to get to talk to you guys after the service and enjoy your company. Um, so uh, this will be short. No, I'm kidding. Uh, so let's go to uh, John chapter 7. John chapter 7, uh, beginning at verse 40, and then we're going to read to the end of the chapter. And if you would, if you found your place there, stand for the honor of reading God's word together. I love this, don't you? Love reading God's word together as a church family. Let's do this. John chapter 7, starting in verse 40. Some of the people, therefore, when they heard these words, were saying, this certainly is the prophet. Others were saying, this is the Christ. Still others were saying, surely the Christ is not going to come from Galilee, is he? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the descendants of David and from Bethlehem, the village where David was? So a division occurred in the crowd because of him. Some of them wanted to seize him, but no one laid hands on him. The officers then came to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said to them, Why did you not bring him? The officers answered, Never, ha <clears throat> Excuse me, never has a man spoken the way this man speaks. The Pharisees then answered them, You have not also been led astray, have you? No one of the rulers or Pharisees has believed in him, has he? But this crowd, which does not know the law, is accursed. Nicodemus, he who came to him before, being one of them, said to them, Our law does not judge a man unless it first hears from him and knows what he is doing, does it? They answered him, You are not also from Galilee, are you? Search and see that no prophet arises out of Galilee. And everyone went to his home. Friends, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord endures forever. Let's thank him for it. Father, we thank you that your word does endure forever. We thank you that in doing this this morning and preaching your word and be devoted to your word, that you uh, speak to us. And so, Father, may we be molded into the image of Christ this morning. May we see you for who you are. If there's one here who has not placed their faith in you, Lord, by your spirit and by the preaching of your word, would you convert them to yourself? Lord, we ask that you would work mightily through the preaching of your word this morning as we know you are faithful to do. It's in Jesus' name we ask this. Amen and amen. You may be seated. You know, I think it's more evident today than it ever has been before that our world is filled with divisions. There are many things that contribute to those divisions. People are divided by things like race or culture or gender or class or politics, religion, and on and on and on it goes. Now, these divisions have been the root cause of a lot of the troubles in this world. No doubt, it's the root cause for much of the evil that has been done, and it's the cause of many heartaches. Many of these divisions often reveal the ugliest aspects of the human race. Of course, we know that many efforts have been made to try to break down the walls of division in this world, right? There are all kinds of awareness groups. There are various agencies who are trying to encourage more toleration and acceptance of one another. 
Even groups that attempt to get people to emphasize and celebrate those things which make us different from one another. But you know, none of those things, if we see anything in today's culture, have been successful at fully breaking down the walls which divide people. Friends, there is but one solution to the division in this world, and his name is Jesus Christ. Think about this for a moment. Only Christ is able to bring together people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. From every age group, from every social class, only Christ can come and bring a people together to provide a unity so deep that our various differences fall by the wayside. Even in our small fellowship, we have people here who are from different backgrounds and cultures and classes and, of course, different genders. These are the very same thing which are the causes behind that which divides the world. And the amazing thing is, those things don't matter in the church, or at least they shouldn't. This is yet another way in which the church is distinct from the world. But I think in this text today, even though it's fair to say that Jesus breaks down the walls of division for those who belong to him, it's also very true that he is the great divider of mankind. We see that division firsthand in our account before us this morning. Look at the John, uh, John chapter 7 and the first four verses, 40 through 43, here, and reread them with me. See if you see some divisions here. Some of the people, therefore, when they heard these words, were saying, this certainly is the prophet. Others were saying, this is the Christ. Still others were saying, surely the Christ is not going to come from Galilee, is he? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the descendants of David and from Bethlehem, the village where David was? So a division occurred in the crowd because of him. So you see, easy. Because of Jesus, there is a division. This morning, we come to see a real-life example of how Jesus is the great divider of men. We see it here and how people reacted to that glorious sermon that he preached. You remember that sermon from last week, right? Whereby he invited all who heard to come to him and drink that they might have their hearts overflowing with living water. There were three different groups of people who heard that day and each group had a different response which ultimately led to the divisions between the groups. One group, the first group we see, that people responded to a sermon saying, this certainly is the prophet. By this, they were acknowledging probably at least one of two things. They may have thought that Jesus was the prophet prophesied by Moses all, all the way back in Deuteronomy chapter 18. If that was the case, they were at least acknowledging that Jesus was divine or God sent. On the other hand, it was commonly believed that God would send a prophet ahead of the Messiah according to Micah 4, 5, and 6. And in that case, if, if that's what they're thinking, they're basically saying that Jesus is the one who filled the very role that John the baptizer filled. Whichever the case may be, this group didn't have the full picture of who Jesus is. Those who thought that this was the prophet like unto Moses, they were on the right track, but they didn't take the train far enough to the station. The others were even more misguided. You see, Jesus is most certainly the prophet. But he is more than the prophet. He is the Messiah. And there was another group, the second group that responded to the sermon saying, this is the Christ. Well, this is a Sunday school answer. Obviously, we know which group was the right group, right? This group. This is obviously the right response. That is exactly what the people should have come away thinking after hearing Jesus preach and seeing what he had done. Of course, we don't know if these people had a genuine, true, living, and saving faith, but we do know they at least had the right response. Jesus is the Christ. But then there was the third group. This group simply responded to those who said that Jesus is the Christ. And they responded with, really? <laughs> you think this is the Christ? You think, you think the Christ is going to come from Galilee? Look at verse 42. Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the descendants of David and from Bethlehem, the village where David was? See, they don't buy it. They don't see how he could possibly be the Messiah. This third group, in my mind at least, is the most interesting because they were correct in their understanding about where the Messiah was supposed to come from. They were right about that. At the same time, there's something very wrong about them 
as well. And that is, they were too stubborn for their own good. Now, I don't know if you know anybody who's stubborn. I'm just looking at all the wives' faces right now as they uh, poke their head out. I don't know if you know anybody who's stubborn, but stubbornness, this idea of stubbornness is exactly what we see in this third group. Check this out. Why do I say that they're stubborn? Think about it for a moment. They were content to believe that what they believe about Jesus was it. And they didn't feel the need to know anything more about him. They thought they knew it all when it came to this subject of the Messiah, even though they didn't. Now, it's funny because all they simply had to do here was ask Jesus, hey, where were you born? And they would have discovered that he was from Bethlehem and he was from the seed of David. But since they were content with what they already knew about him, they didn't feel the need to ask. They already knew it all. They knew everything there was to know about him. And this group is interesting because they are very actually typical of unbelievers inside the church and outside the church. See, these people had some understanding of what the scripture said concerning the Messiah who was coming, but they were unwilling to pursue the truth. They were content to remain stubborn in what they thought they knew about the faith. They know what they know, and that's all that really matters. If something doesn't line up with what they believe, they straight up reject it out of hand. Throw it by the wayside. This is the arrogance of unbelief. There is no question about it. Unbelief is conceited. Unbelief always says, my mind is made up. I know everything I need to know about Jesus. And the Jesus that the Christians preach, it does not line up with what I understand about Jesus, and that is all that I have to say about that. You know what's odd? What's odd about many of the unbelievers in the world is they reject Christianity, but they really have no idea about what they are rejecting and why they reject it. Because they have no idea what the Bible actually preaches and says. They don't take the time to pursue the truth. They are arrogant and conceited in their own minds and understanding. For instance, I've had several conversations like this. For Some will say, I don't believe in Christianity because the Bible isn't true. Really? Okay. How do you know that? How do you know the Bible is not true? Well, there are a lot of contradictions in the Bible, so it can't be true. Really? Can, can I ask you, would you care just to give me like one example from your study in the Scriptures of those areas of contradiction? Well, I don't really have any with me, but I know that there are contradictions in it. They really don't know, do they? (laughs) They haven't taken the time for themselves to pursue the truth, to pursue what the Bible actually does teach. There are countless examples of similar situations like that. You see, unbelief really doesn't feel the need to pursue the truth. In fact, the scriptures tell us that unbelievers really don't want to know the truth. As we're told by the Apostle Paul in Romans 3.11, there is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. You see, this third group of people had some knowledge, didn't they? They had a little knowledge. They had the right information about the Messiah from the scriptures, but they were missing the key ingredient. They lacked the Holy Spirit's work of grace in their hearts. They had the Messiah himself standing before their very eyes, and they were unable to recognize him. It's because they were blinded by their sin of unbelief. You see, we can know what the Bible says from cover to cover, but if we don't recognize Jesus, if we don't come to Jesus, then we will never truly understand the Bible because the Bible is all about him. Now, please, please note this. It is important to study the scriptures. It is vitally important to study and know what the scriptures teach. But we must never think it is enough to simply know the facts. To merely know the doctrines of the Bible or the confession of our faith. We must know Christ if our knowledge of the word is going to be beneficial to us in any way, shape, or form. After all, the Bible says even the demons believe and shudder. And and I see this happening. This is worrisome in our culture and text today. Let me ask you, Christian, when's the last time you've grown in your theology and doctrine? 
Your study of God, your study of the scriptures, it should never be stagnant. If you've ever gotten to the point where you say, you know what, I know enough about this particular doctrine. That's a warning sign. The Christian life, you are always, always growing and learning and growing and learning. Always. If you've ever felt like you've arrived, that you've got this down, that no one can change your mind or, or even do anything about a particular doctrine, no one can grow you in your faith in any way, shape, or form, then you've got the sin of arrogance. <laughs> You need to humbly bow to the scriptures continually and be willing to grow and learn. That's what this life looks like. Understand this, above all, more than we need head knowledge, of course, we know we need heart knowledge. Of course, it's ideal to have both. We're not saying you don't need head knowledge. Heart knowledge and head knowledge are both good, but if it came down to which of the two is more important, it is heart knowledge every time. Heart knowledge, it's not something that can be taught in a classroom. It can't be gained from your friends, family, nor can it be gained from going to a seminary. It is a gift of God. Head knowledge without heart knowledge won't do you a lick of good in the end. Folks, if if we have heart knowledge, if we've come to know and understand our sinful condition, if we've come to know and understand the person and the work of Jesus Christ, then we have more knowledge than the most intelligent people in the world. You might not be educated in Greek, Hebrew, or Latin. You might not be great at math, science, or philosophy. But if you know Jesus Christ, you have the most pious form of knowledge that you can have. And you should be very grateful if you do, because this kind of knowledge, it's special. This kind of knowledge is something that's not common to all of mankind. Look again at verse 43, what it says. So a division occurred in the crowd because of him. Because of who? Because of Jesus We're reminded about Jesus' preaching here. Something that's very vital about Jesus' preaching. We're told that there was a division among the people because of him, and this is always the case when Jesus preaches. As we stated previously, preaching has a twofold effect. It hardens hearts, and it softens hearts. Jesus is somebody who brings division in this world. When you think about it, you ought to be thankful that that's the case. The fact that there is a division between us and the world is a testimony to the fact that God is at work among us and that he has not left us alone. It shows that God is not left to ourselves to be one with the world so we could perish along with the world. Folks, it is nothing but the grace of God that has brought this division between those who belong to him and those who don't. It's because of God's grace that there is enmity between the offspring of God and the seed of the serpent. Understood rightly, this division, it's actually a blessing. It's a great blessing. When it comes to the subject of division, we do well to remember something we sometimes forget. That as we read in our text today, in our scripture reading, Jesus tells us himself that he came to bring division. Look what he said in Luke 12. If you want to turn there, you can. I know we don't have screens there. Luke 12, 51 through 53. There's a similar account there in Matthew chapter 10 as well. But Luke 12, 51 through 53. It says this. Jesus speaking, do you suppose that I came to grant peace on earth? I tell you no, but rather division. For from now on five members in one household will be divided. Three against two and two against three. Verse 53, they will be divided, father against son, and son against father, mother against daughter, and daughter against mother, mother mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. You see, God's word is something that brings to the foreground the division which has already existed in the hearts of men. God's word is a light, and it sheds that light on the heart of men to reveal their true sinful condition. It reveals the fact that their hearts are divided against God and his people. God's word is always something that brings division. Let's keep in mind the context of this passage here. These three different groups represent people in the church. These are all church members in these three groups, by the way, right? Because who else would have been hanging around the temple during the feast? It was the people of God who were surrounding Jesus, wanting to hear what he had to say. They were part of the visible church. Indeed, the truth of God's word is something that brings division even among people in Christ's church. 
Speaking of these divisions in the church, Charles Spurgeon, the prince of preachers, once commented on the situation of his day, and he characterized the situation with these words. Listen closely. He said, I have heard of a whole parish in which there were no religious bickering because there was no religion. There were no religious strifes because nobody had anything worth striving for. And that is not a state of things over which I can rejoice. Now, let's not, let's not go out of bounds with this and say, okay, so I need to just start arguing with my neighbor immediately, right? I need to take these things and start yelling at them. That's, that's what God wants. No, listen, the idea is division in the body of Christ, it's a sad reality, but it's a reality just the same. Why do you think we have so many denominations today? Each denomination has split off from some other group because they believe they have some of the right understanding of some truth of Scripture that the other group doesn't. Truth is what causes even the division. Now, thankfully, one day that won't be the case. And we can look forward to that day with great anticipation. But until then, let us recognize that until Christ comes again, we must accept the fact that divisions do and will exist. Let's not be surprised by them. In fact, I don't think I've ever met a human being on this earth that I agreed 100% about every single one of the doctrines in the Bible. You know that? I can't find it. My, my own family, even my own wife, we differ in some areas. There's not one person on this earth, I would say, we line up 100% understanding every verse, every text, the exact same right way. And you know what? That's okay. <laughs> let, me, let me tell you this, because, because I'm not perfect. I, I'm still sinful. Now, now, that doesn't change the fact that there's truth to be had. That doesn't change the drive. That doesn't mean we don't pursue truth and that there is truth and I believe that there's truth. That's not what I'm saying at all. But when it comes to non-negotiable issues, of course there's a division. When it comes to the fact that Jesus himself is God, that he did die on the cross, these are some things that we have no bones about. They're absolutely 100% true. You can't argue with them. But some of the other things in Scripture, friends, we got to let it go. In some of the other things in Scripture, friends, it's okay to agree to disagree on some things. It's okay. <laughs> and and I, I know this because this is the struggle. Once again, we human beings like to go completely out of bounds to the extremes on both ends. And so we'll say, you know what? If the Bible's true, then, then we all should have all truth, and I'm the only one that has all the truth, and you don't, and you need to align with me. Does that remind you of anything? Does that remind you of the Pharisees at all? No, you stop there. There is truth to be had. That's good. There is truth to be had. Stop there. Let's pursue it with grace. Let's recognize that the only reason you have any truth whatsoever is because Christ has enlightened your eyes to the scriptures. You're dependent upon him for that. But then we go completely out of bounds and say, well, you know, if there's, if there's not any real, real truth, then there's no need to pursue any of these things. Then let's just all be okay with everything, no matter what you believe, and accept anything in the church. That would be going against the truth of Scripture. That's an oxymoron. You can't do that. You know those coexist stickers, right, on the back of bumper cars? Bumper cars. On the back of the bumpers of the cars? I've spent too many times with kids, right? It's nonsense. You can't coexist with some of these statements. You just can't. Because you have to believe the Bible is true. But on these non-negotiable items, friends, let's be humble and show grace with one another. Let's admit that we don't have perfect minds. Let's dig deep into the word of God. Let's explain it and search the truth. And yet, let's show grace to one another in the midst of it. This is understood when we understand the idea that God himself is sovereign. The same God that is sovereign enough to save you is sovereign enough to fix your theology and grow you in him. You need to believe that. Anyways, I don't know where I was. Some of these things I just had in my heart and wanted to say. So let's go back to the sermon that was written. Like I said, lightning struck my computer this week. So Brother Vernon said that my sermon should be electrifying. I don't know what that... It's great. Now thankfully one day... I love this. It won't, we can all look forward to the day where we will have the absolute truth. Well, we will know exactly the truth. 
And I, I love that. We, we won't have to worry about these divisions. The truth is something that divides, but it's also something that unites. We must strive, and here's the key, strive for unity in the truth with our fellow brothers and sisters. Strive for unity together alongside one another. Let's move on to verses 44 through 49. Some of them wanted to seize him, verse 44, but no one laid hands on him. The officers then came to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said to them, why did you not bring him? And the officers answered, never has a man spoken the way this man speaks. The Pharisees then answered him, you've not also been led astray, have you? No one of the rulers or Pharisees has believed in him, has he? But this crowd, which does not know the law, is accursed. In verse 44, again, we see nobody was able to lay a hand on Jesus even though they wanted to. And the reason for this was provided for us all the way back in verse 30 of this chapter. We are told that his hour had not yet come. That's it. That's the reason why they couldn't touch Jesus. Nothing could be done to Jesus unless it was in accordance with his father's perfect will and timing. But we also get some insight here regarding the pride of the chief priest and and the Pharisees. They were so full of themselves that they could hardly believe that the officers failed to carry out their command. You see this? They were dismayed that the officers came back empty-handed. They thought, how dare someone not do exactly what we told them to do? How dare you come back here without Jesus? But even more shocking to them was the reason the officers gave why Jesus wasn't there. Did you see that? They said, never has a man spoken the way this man speaks. You didn't hear what this man said. They were actually quite right, by the way. (laughs) There has never been a preacher like Jesus, but notice again how we see the great need for the work of the Holy Spirit in people. These men had heard the perfect preacher preach a perfect sermon, yet the only impression it made on them was that they went away thinking that Jesus was an exceptional preacher. Friends, it's important to keep in mind that conviction is not the same as conversion. They had a conviction that never has a man spoken in the way he does. But what effect did it have on them? You would think that if they had been converted, they would still be sitting at the feet of Jesus and decide to do like the others, drop their way of life and follow him. But that's not what we see going on. These men had a strong conviction about Jesus and his preaching, but that doesn't necessarily translate to their conversion. You see, even hearing the right preacher, the perfect preacher, requires the work of the Spirit to make use of that message that is preached. It's not good enough to simply sit under good preachers. We have to pray for the Spirit to open our ears to hear what God is saying to us. Left to ourselves, we might like or dislike a preacher, but our impression at the end of the day, it has little importance. The most important question is whether we have heard the true preacher, Jesus Christ, speaking to us from his word. That's the question we need to ask ourselves. See, even though Jesus himself in physical form is not in our presence preaching sermons, he's still preaching to us today. He's still preaching sermons today. He does so through the agency of his ministers. Why, it is certainly true that no preacher today is perfect. It's also true that, get this, whenever a preacher preaches the truth of God's word, Christ is speaking through him. The Pharisees, they didn't like what the officers had to say about Jesus being a great preacher. And so they responded by asking them if they were led astray also. They thought that the only way that Jesus could get people to believe and follow him was for them to be led astray. See the arrogance there? They thought they were deceived. Maybe you've come across a similar response in your life. Maybe in conversation, you begin to talk to somebody and they happen to think you might be a Christian or talking, they start to get collation. Oh, you're, you, you must be one of those Christians, right? You're one of those born again types, are you? You are one of those people who believe in Jesus and miracles and things like heaven and hell, right? See, the point being is that you have to be a simpleton. Somebody who lacks intelligence to believe in those things. But notice what they go on to say. They ask the officers this, In verse 48, no one of the rulers of the Pharisees has believed in him, has he? But this crowd, which does not know the law, is accursed. You catch this? They're basically using themselves here for the standard of what ought to be believed concerning Jesus. You see, if none of them believed in Jesus, then nobody else should either because they are the ones who are the experts in God's word. 
They're the ones who are the academics. They've been trained in such matters. So everyone should follow their lead, and anyone who doesn't is accursed, just like the rest of the lowly people of the crowd who didn't really know or understand God's holy law. Again, we see a division spring up here. A division between the leaders of the church and what we might call the laity. We might characterize it as a division between the academics and the Joe the Plumber types, right? What arrogance we see here. You see, that implication is that Jesus and his followers are simpletons because none of them had any training in the schools of the rabbis. Remember, too, that Jesus' disciples came mostly from the common people and ways of life. So Jesus and his disciples shouldn't be followed because they don't know what they're talking about. They're uneducated. Now, lest we think that this was only a problem back in the days of Christ, we must be reminded the background for the Reformation. You remember this? The same thing was happening back then, wasn't it? The common people were told what to believe and they were told not to question it. If some teaching came along that didn't have the approval of the priest and the pope, that teaching and those who followed would be considered just like these people, accursed because they don't understand. The same thing continues to go on today, not even just in Rome. Today, even in our circles, it would seem that scholars and academics are the ones calling some of the shots as to what people are supposed to believe. Today, men in ivory towers have discovered the truth, you see, about what St. Paul really said and what he really meant about the gospel of Jesus Christ and about what justification really means. See, the church has been deceived and misguided for the last hundred years, and the scholars are the ones who have figured it all out for us. We can't possibly understand all the technical difficulties that led them to arrive to this conclusion. We just need to trust them on this. Folks, beware when you see such a great division in the church between her leaders and the rest of the people. We see this in false churches as well, right? People there have set up a hierarchy in the church where people make all the decisions and tell all the others what they're supposed to believe. This is also the way the cults. Their leaders twist scripture and persuade people to believe that God has raised them to be leaders in the church and that God's people should listen to them as modern day prophets. Regardless of what these people say, we know that we all need to study the scripture and hold fast to what Christ's church has confessed over her history. God's word was given to the church. So let me apply this for you. If the only Bible you get is right now, that's a problem. If the only explanation, study of Scripture, meditation on Scripture you're getting is right now, friends, you need to check your heart. God has given you His Word. He didn't just give it to me. He gave it to you. You know what I'm going to refer to here, right? I'm going to refer to Brother Johnny's class, the Bereans. (laughs) Who when Paul preached to them, what did they do? They sought the scriptures to see whether these things are so. Friends, you ought to do the same. We have this more readily available than any other country in the world. It's given to you. God's word to you. What are you doing with it? Take hold of it. Take it in. Consume it. Meditate it. Chew upon it. It's worth your time. Understand this. The word was given to all of us, and it's intended to be read and understood by all of us. This is one of the reasons the reformers were so consistent and persistent in translating the Bible to the common tongue of the people. While the leaders of the church tried their best to keep the Bible out of the hands of the common people, these reformers had the conviction that God's word is clear and it can be understood by the least educated in Christ's church. Now listen. That doesn't mean that there's not a place for academics. They don't have a place in the church. It simply means that we we must be like the Berean people and hold up what is being said to God's word to check if what they're saying is what we know to be true. Now, you know, there's a bit of irony in the response of the Pharisees and chief priests on our account. In this passage, they call the crowd accursed. Accursed because they supposedly don't know the law, but aren't they the ones who really didn't understand the law? Aren't they the ones who missed it? You see, if they did understand the law, then they would have seen their need for Jesus and they would have followed him. Additionally, they were quite inconsistent in saying that others didn't know the law. Because all the while, 
Here, they're trying to arrest Jesus without any lawful cause, aren't they? Without even hearing what he had to say for himself. As Nicodemus points out, let's conclude with verses 50 to 53. Nicodemus, he who came to him before being one of them, said to them, Our law does not judge a man unless it first hears from him and knows what he's doing, does it? They answered him, You are not also from Galilee, are you? Search and see that no prophet arises out of Galilee. Everyone went to his home. In this final section, we come to yet another division that we see in the text. And this time it's a division among the leadership. A division among Nicodemus and the others among his rank. Again, we see Jesus at the center of this division as well. Nicodemus, he knows that it's wrong to convict Jesus without a fair hearing, but the others aren't troubled at all by this. In fact, they use this as an opportunity to somewhat make fun and ridicule Nicodemus, saying, Nicodemus, are you also from Galilee? What's the reason you're so interested in what's going on with this man from Galilee? In other words, they're saying, are you rooting for Jesus because he's from your hometown? Is there something we missed? Are you from Galilee also? Then they go on to prove to him that he's wasting his time because according to them, no prophet has arisen out of Galilee. They appeal to him, go ahead, Nicodemus, look to the scriptures, see if there's a prophet that has arisen out of Galilee. Now, if they were telling him to go back and search the scriptures because there was a never prophet that that rose out of Galilee, it actually shows their ignorance of the word. Because, friends, there, there are two prophets that came from that area. Jonah and Nahum both came from that area. So the irony would be, they're the ones that really should go back to the scriptures to search and look. The experts actually missed something, didn't they? Either way, Jesus is the cause for division among these leaders. Now, I want us to turn our attention to to Nicodemus. We see him in a good thing here and a not so good thing in this interaction. The good thing is he does stand up and speak out. He speaks up for Jesus, at least in a small way. The not so good thing is that he doesn't come right out and express his faith boldly if he has it at the right time. Maybe he still doesn't have a saving faith yet. We don't know. We know he had one later on. But regardless, Nicodemus certainly serves a reminder to us that God's grace doesn't work at the same pace in all who come to Christ. It would be quite some time, actually a few months or so, before Nicodemus would have the boldness to publicly express his love for Jesus. He finally did so, we know, when he and Joseph of Arimathea took the body of Jesus to care for it and lay it in a tomb. Remember what was happening when all the other disciples, at this point, they'd gone and scattered in all kinds of different directions. They were scared, and yet Nicodemus was right there, boldly caring for the body of Christ. It took time for the Lord to work in Nicodemus' life, to get him to that point where he could speak and act boldly in regard to his faith. So the lesson we might take from that is that we need to be careful that we aren't too quick to condemn people as unbelievers because we don't see the amount of grace in their lives that we think they should have. We do well to consider that it's not always the fastest runner who wins the race. It's not always the people who come out flying out the gate on fire that make it to the end. The ultimate question is whether we have any work of God's grace in our hearts. It may be a small amount, Or it may be great, but the most important question is whether we have any at all. As Ryle says, it says, better a little grace than none. Better to move slowly than to stand still and sin in this world. Friends, Jesus is the great divider of men. The question for us this morning is which side of the division do we find ourselves on? I want to ask you this because I think this attitude of the Pharisees is something we struggle with in the church. It reminds me of my dad during football season, right? You know football season's coming up? And if you've ever met Tim Page, I love the man, you can't tell him a thing about what the Gators should or should not do because he knows it, all right? There's no, no, your your opinion is wrong. My wife says I'm the same way. I don't understand what she means by that. Uh, Her opinion's wrong in that. I'm just, no, I'm kidding. Um, But this idea, right, football season's come up and men, you get this, right? You know everything there is to know about football, despite probably never running a football practice in your life, right? You know everything that should happen and shouldn't happen, despite never having a a play calling responsibility or being hired as a coach in any way, shape, or form. You know it. Nobody can tell you anything different. I I wonder, gosh, I hope that stops with football. (laughs) Because if, if that's the way you are with a Christian life and your theology, I think the Bible would say that that's, that's a form of unbelief. And you need to check your heart to see whether or not you're a believer. I, 
Understand this. When we come to God's word, am I telling you things you just already know? You already got it. There's no need for growth in your life. That's not how we approach the word of God. That's the opposite of how we approach the word of God. We approach the word of God with our our knees bent, our heads bowed, understanding we have little to no knowledge apart from God revealing to us. So God, we're dependent upon you. Feed us with the word of God. Feed us. We're desperately hungry and thirsty for the word. So if you're a Christian here this morning, my encouragement to you is if you've had that attitude, if you struggle with that attitude, which I've, I have, the pastors are the worst about this. The pastors struggle with this more than anything. If that's you, would you, I just want to invite you to repent. Do what I've had to do several times in my ministry and even this week on a daily basis is repent of thinking you have all knowledge because you don't. And come humbly to the word of God eager to hear what he has to say. And friend, if you're lost this morning, if you don't know Christ, there is a division in this world. The question once again becomes, which side are you on? Are you on the side of Christ where you've been set apart because of the grace of Christ and the work of Christ? Are you on the side of the world where you're an enemy of Christ, living for yourself and yourself only and serving yourself? That's the question. May God add his blessing to the the preaching of his word. Would you stand and please join your hearts with me in prayer?